Okay, so lovely to see everyone today. It'd be great to have a, have a conversation. Shall we look at a piece of art? So what do people think about this painting? What's your first response? Whenever I see paintings of Manchester, I'm like, where is that? <laughs> So I remember when I, I went on, a, I think, Google Images and I was like walking, trying to find the exact prospect so I could find it. I want to stand where he stood to paint that. You know, that was my, my thing. And did you find it? I did. I did find it. And I, then I get all lost in the history of the buildings and, and everything. I go on a real, like, rabbit hole, as they say, and I just, yeah, but... It's very, and, and when you stood in front of the painting, the scale is very immersive as well. One thing that I think is really um, sort of interesting about it is the whole sort of mythologising of the city, um, which obviously, you know, has happened in the past and still happens today. But here particularly, if you think about it in 1912, it would have been, you know, very smoggy, very polluted, um, you know, not particularly, not well terrible working conditions for some people, um, a lot of inequality. Um, but here, kind of, let's sort of romanticise this view. He's kind of, you know, oh, isn't it lovely here? He's kind of using those French Impressionist um, techniques and the, the beautiful sort of colours, the greys and the mauves, and um, to make this really beautiful scene that's framed by that, you know, lovely arch. But actually, would it really have been so nice? I'm not so sure. We're thinking about how how the gallery relates to to Manchester and its people. So, do you think that is a really key way in which the gallery does relate to people? Is this this unlocking of memory and association? And um, and do you think that's it's very it's important that the gallery has images of Manchester and as as part of its collection? Is that is that key? Do you think? Yes, I mean the number of conversations you have with visitors coming to the gallery who will sit down in front of a painting and roll, roll out their entire life story based on that one image or, or an anecdote because it, it's, been, it's been present in their life or their parents' lives or their grandparents and it's something they remember and recognise and it gives them an emotional connection to the past and to the city. So it, 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 acts, it, it acts like a memory box, the, the gallery, for, you know, for, for some people. That's a beautiful way to put to put it um, a memory box that's really nice <laughs> so I work quite a lot with people who are learning English and maybe newly arrived in Manchester and this painting in particular and a couple of other valets are really important for kind of people getting a sense of um, belonging and understanding of the city So I've got a reproduction of this hanging in my hall. It was a present when I left ICI, but it was also my bus route to school. <laughs> so <laughs> going down Oxford Road. So, and I, I think it's fantastic. I love it. We've got this collection of things that have accumulated over the past 200 years. And we've got, how many have we got in the collection, Hannah or Janet? How many objects is it? I think we usually say 49,000, but it depends whether you count each individual button in the button collection, that sort of thing. At this point now, what do we do with this? What's people first sort of thought about this? Is it to use or is it the decoration or mm. what would you what would you do with it, Margaret? Would you use it or I wouldn't use it. I'd put it <laughs> on the shelf somewhere. Janet, you, you know more about uh, teapots than any of us here. <laughs> what, what was it very common to have a camel or animal shaped for teapots at the time? 
it was an innovation and it the shape comes about as a result of the technical innovation of the material that the teapot was made from using molds to make wonderful novelty teapots and that's where novelty teapots began and of course they're still popular today is there a recognized origin point of novelty teapots is this it is this the is this the turning point yeah this is it <laughs> this is it this is how they began wow suddenly feels like it's got much more gravitas now uh, yeah absolutely i don't know i don't think anything with a decorative dolphin flying <laughs> flying up from behind can possibly have gravitas but you have to take your point <laughs> when you put it like that it was a bit controversial because not everybody thought that ceramics were art you know some people didn't like it and there were some people to whom that sort of aesthetic was not appealing and they sort of questioned whether it really was the right place for this material in an art gallery What's your first response to this object in the sense that it is in that it's part of the public resource in the gallery? My question was like, oh, why, why have they chosen to put that in gallery three? Um, you know, because I didn't know anything about it, it was just a, a watch. And then I suppose I went historical and I was thinking, is it to do with the time when it would the institute you know Manchester Art Gallery was formed um, and the industrial revolution and time becoming this measured thing that it wasn't measured before and yeah made me start thinking about that and then do we lose time in galleries and and, and yeah how we choose to spend yeah. it I was trying to second guess why it was selected and decide to second guess that yeah, well, it's you're right. It, we, we're worth, it is this idea of time uh, that it's partly why it ended up here, but it's partly also this idea of makers in Manchester and whether the gallery is input is you know is a gallery a place to collect and and think about making um, in the city, not just of artworks um, but of objects like this. I, I guess I think about it as. Um... A functional object that would have had a use, um, and it's been kind of museumified. It's it's part of a collection. I mean, it it does show how eclectic the collection actually is, which perhaps hasn't been shown very publicly before. To have an object like this, um, that's that's a tool as well as a beautiful thing. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm interested in that. You know why why it was collected and but also what use it had before when it was it might have been worn by somebody and used out and about on the street um i was also thinking how um if my nine-year-old looked at that i'm not sure she'd even know <laughs> how to use it because <laughs> people's kind of reading of time even that you know the the interfaces that we use is, are different now um and i'm not sure whether you know people kids would even have you know the idea of what those you know the roman numerals um would mean yeah i think it's bizarre to think it's permanently stuck at like 18 minutes to five as well as just that's it it's never gonna necessarily be go any further forward in time or, or back it because we won't probably use it ever as a watch Kate, have you got any thoughts on it? I think galleries play a lot with that idea of, of objects that no longer function as they were originally intended to do. Um, so we have a non-functioning watch that stopped just before you can go home at five. But funny things happen to, to time in an art gallery um, because there's the... There's that time that the object was acquired and then there's our relationship to it now and then there's what it says or could potentially say about our future. When you take a historic picture and you put it next to something that's more contemporary, so you sort of, you, you 
um, time comes together in a different way in the art gallery. Shall we look at an artwork that's going to be in our new introductory gallery, which thinks about this idea of how things arrived in the gallery and were they collected by the gallery or were they given to the gallery? There's so many routes into the, to the collection. And it's probably been on display quite a lot because it's sort of become a bit of a favourite. I wondered what people initially think of it as a, as a painting. It's kind of hyper real. It's yeah. it's so bright and it's so detailed. It kind of, yeah, it's it's more. It's almost more kind real of, than real. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I always find it like a, quite a strange painting, and I just I've walked past it. It must be like you know a million times, but and I and I still to this day can't. I mean, I'm sure there's a narrative and there's there's um history behind it, but just on face value, I can't figure out exactly what she's thinking. Well, some people think that the the sort of flirting with one another, and then on some tours, people think that she's pushing him away. So it, I think it's how you look at it and when you look at it. Yeah. yeah, and then I, I find this style, I mean, we've got a lot of paintings like this at the gallery in the sense that the pre-Raphaelites, of which the painter William Holman Hunt was part of, was they love to paint in this very precise style. And I, I find it a bit, I just, I don't know, I don't, it doesn't, I don't like it very much, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> Well, I say I don't like it. I don't like it, but then it draws me in and it makes, I, I feel curious about it. It's, it's almost like a record of real life, isn't it? On, in the moment, unless you're completely socially aware of everything that's going on, you only go with your own narrative, don't you? Yeah. Um, so it's quite, it's quite interesting if, if these are issues that are still going on today that can be summarised by a painting that's 150 years old. When the gallery first opened, what, how did, how, okay, my question probably is, if I was to start a brand new art gallery tomorrow, where would I acquire the things I would need for it to open on its first day? So like when Manchester Art Gallery first opened its doors, was it a private collection of things or were they things that were acquired through other galleries around the country or... What was on the first day? What, how did it work? What we wouldn't give to be able to go back and walk around that suite of galleries as it was oh, then. <laughs> there, there's, you know, there is an occasion here, which is definitely, you know, which has this theatrical staging uh, set up to it. Um, which I think is now sort of, you know, perhaps not as obvious uh, visually, but functions in very similar ways. Mm. There's been a bit of a phenomenon at the gallery recently at the weekends. Sorry, not recently, pre-COVID. People coming in to use the gallery as a backdrop to their um, social media and using selfie sticks and kind of doing Instagram posts behind in front of certain artworks and using it as a performative environment which I think is kind of interesting it's it's and and not really looking at the art much at all apparently just using the space as a performative space uh, trying to create a particular impression how real that impression is I think is a is a, a totally different a totally different conversation and that I, that I find interesting why do they feel that need to do that and they obviously will choose, oh, we'll stand in front of this artwork. Well, why? And what are they trying to say? Even that idea of using something as a backdrop, while part of me um, sort of, you know, says, you know, good on you. That's, uh, that's absolutely fine. But part of me is saying, oh, why? You know, don't you want to engage with this artwork and understand the story that it's, uh, it's trying to convey that uh, all these wonderful colleagues have uh, spent 
hours and days thinking about uh, the narrative that they want you to to take away and 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 you've just turned your back and and, and are creating your own um, and i think that's perhaps one of the interesting links is that libraries are not interested in creating narratives or you know necessarily well i suppose they would in terms of the choices they get in their books whereas with the museums almost by definition just a choice of saying what do you put up and what do you what do you put in a store is a, is a is an exercise in, in narrative making if it's about making your identity with a particular backdrop that is brilliant um, and if it's about um, spending time with a particular artwork that's brilliant too and if you choose a gallery as your wedding venue then um, that's equally brilliant yet there is still a disconnect with some people not everybody feels like the gallery belongs to them there is still something about performing in that space that for many people is prohibitive it's trying to be trying to be as open to as many people and all things to everybody as possible i guess can i add on to that one because that's i see something that gets mediated a lot around behavior and obviously with school groups that's a, a prime example of um us encouraging conversation chatty liveliness and the messages that those young children are getting are really mixed because you you will hear them when the coats when they arrive and they're taking their coats off you're representing the school don't let me down do this don't that it's like a library they get these messages and then you through the rest of your the visit are trying to slowly sort of unpick that with them and give them that encouragement Yeah, how do you think about this in relation to Manchester Art Gallery having this painting in its collection? I think I, I thought a lot about this one, guys. <laughs> so I think when this this a piece like this is is lovely, and I think it just should be shown in context. I mean, in relation to more celebratory pieces, because what I get what I get asked a lot is, or the comment I hear a lot in workshops is that the children don't see anyone that looks like them. And I understand that too. Um, and I spent a lot of time around the arts in my life. And oftentimes the only depictions of people of colour are ones that are quite um, down, um, a bit downtrodden, a bit depressed, a bit other. You know, they're, they're not very... They're, you know, you don't walk in and see the 10 foot tall celebratory black queen or anything like that. You always see one where they're an asylum seeker or they're, you know, on the street. So it's, and that's not only of people of color, but I think largely that's how the representation is. So I think a piece like this is wonderful, but it would, I think, be nice to see it next to um, a more flamboyantly beautiful celebratory piece of a positive, strong aspect um, of people of colour as well, for me. So it's not like, oh, there I am, and therefore I must just look a bit sad and wistful and like I don't really belong. So I think it could have a dual message. I've been in waiting rooms like this before, you know, whether it's for, whether it's for housing benefits or job seekers or whatever, or, you know, in a council building, they're very sterile, cold places. Yeah, you've got the two figures, they're turned inwards towards each other. You know, they're, they're, they're not separate, they're not gazing out in different directions. Um, although they're not, you know, they're, they're sort of engaging sort of non-verbally. You know, non and mm -hmm. so I think that's, that's, re that's, yeah. that's really key to the entire painting. It's because you've, you've got that and you've got the sterility of the, the wall behind them and the window and then the landscape out beyond them. This piece was shown for about 10 years in the Manchester Gallery when the gallery initially reopened after the big capital project in 2002 and there was a whole section about sort of landscapes and views of the city and they were all hung on the horizon line so they all had different heights depending on where the horizon line was in the paint in the picture and I think this was shown there in that context so very much about landscapes um, you know I'm not quite sure whether we do that now. I totally know what you mean, Vanessa, but I also think there is something quite powerful about this for a lot of people. I, as I said, the kind of friendship, the support, the times of hardship in our lives. 
So I know for a lot of ESOL learners, they will see a, um, a situation that perhaps they can relate to within this within this painting. But I know what you mean that it needs to be counterbalanced with uh, happier times, more mm -hmm. powerful um, yeah. images of people of colour as well. So it's, um, but I, I think there's some truth in this painting that people can relate to. So, so do you feel like you you want to start a gallery, Haru? Oh, I'd love to. It's probably, probably just my living room and my uh, and my hallway. So I'd have to have like single file two people at a time. Well, that would suit the current times. <laughs> I think it's interesting this thing of every day, whether you collect everyday things or whether you collect super designed things, or I mean, perhaps we need to collect. A bit of everything I don't know it's um what what I guess it's that what are we there for are we there to document ev the everyday experience of people in Manchester or are we there to show the best art and design from across the world um what do people think what should the collection what should it do yeah that's a good question I mean <laughs> I think I was going to ask that very question actually what how do we collect today how, how do we as an art gallery collect today um because we do we do collect we do buy and collect um Manchester artists don't we we we, we do that um but then you know but then there's the question of who decides that their artists worth collecting And, and therefore then the challenge um, of the museum space, and I think what makes it so interesting, is the possibility of somebody coming in to intervene in that narrative, to say, okay, how do I, you know, where am I in, in, in this story? Um, and I think, uh, you know, especially this idea of a, of a city or a civic institution, which is somehow for the city, reflects the city, you know, how, how does the city, you know, talk back in a way? I suppose this is, is an interesting question. Yeah, Manchester's the best city. Um, I brag about it. Um, I'd like to improve access to the gallery and arts in general for Manchester residents who currently don't use us and perhaps don't have the confidence to walk through our doors. I think the future will look a bit different post-Covid. Post so maybe we need art everywhere. Mm -hmm.